Well, um, thanks for having me tonight. This is always uh, one of my favorite events. The, the Master Equine Program is one where we have a lot of good questions, a lot of good uh, discussion. I've got a lot of materials in the handouts tonight. Um, we are not going to make it through all of that. Okay. Uh, some of that is just for, for your reference. And I'm hoping to make it through as much as we can. But my, my main objective here tonight is to make sure that you get all of your questions answered. So as we go through, feel free to stop me. Feel free to ask a question. And uh, we'll address it as we go. Okay. So what I'm going to try to uh, cover tonight is some basic information about forage crops. And, but I, the very first thing I want to do is to highlight uh, some of the things that we have on the website. Uh, we have a forages webpage and a fairly easy, easily remembered website address that has pretty much everything that, that you'd want to know about how to establish um, and, and maintain and, and manage the forage species that we grow in Georgia. In addition to that website, you can also sign up for email updates uh, where you would get once every month or so, and, and sometimes during the growing season it's more frequent than that, uh, just kind of an update or general overview of some changes or some, you know, when fall armyworms start showing up or something like that, uh, you'll be getting uh, updates about that. And you can even follow us on Facebook. We got with the 21st century here and. Uh, uh, we're on Facebook, and if you don't know what Facebook is, ask the nearest teenager to you, and they'll tell you uh, tell you what it is. But uh, uh, as also a part of that program uh, that we have on the website, and that's actually why we have a video camera here today. Uh, we we've been trying to get more and more material up on the website. In fact, I was uh, uh, talking with a, a horse owner just the other day down in Walton County, and we went through a whole load of stuff, and, and I said. You know, just about everything, if you have a question about this, uh, if you have a question about one of the topics that we talked about, just about everything that I've talked about is already in uh, a video that you can go back and review if you'd like. So right now we have about 30 or so videos up on the web, and tonight's meeting hopefully will be up there later on. Uh, for those of you that uh, subscribe to iTunes or, or use iTunes or subscribe to one of the uh, podcast. This is our podcast page, but we also have uh, an iTunes U presence where you can get online and actually download university classes and, and uh, actually take a course online uh, via those uh, via those courses. Now, you you would take it virtually; uh, it wouldn't be uh, in real time, so it would be different from uh, going to uh, obviously going to the campus. So. Let me give you kind of an overview of like what I'd like to talk to you tonight about is just an overview of some of the key forages that we use in the southeast, uh, where they fit, where they don't fit, what are the things that are best uh, for horse pastures, and what are some things that just are probably best left alone and not utilized. We're going to talk about what goes into actually making a good forage system, and what I mean by system is to be able to have multiple species out there where you can graze year-round. Uh, or as low, at least as close to year-round as we possibly can. Um, I also want to spend some time specifically with when we're talking about horses, they have their own grazing behavior, their own uh, unique way of, of uh, grazing in a pasture. And I want to spend some time talking about that aspect of it and what implications that has on forage growth. Uh, also focusing here on forage quality. Uh, I'm sure you all have seen the run up in prices in sweet peas, just like uh, you know our dairy and beef cattle guys have seen that with uh, uh, supplementation prices for them. Uh, I'm going to show you some techniques to help keep those uh, that sweet feed bill to, uh, to a minimum. Uh, fun, uh, finally, one of the things I want to spend some time on is reducing your hay cost. Uh, I'm sure you've seen uh, in the past several years a run up in hay cost. This, this past year hadn't been too awful bad. Uh, but it's going to really get high. Plus, along the line, uh, along the way, I'd like to cover a few diversions too, just to uh, kind of uh, break up the break up the program a little bit. One of the things that we do in our classes is uh, interject some uh, some fun things to do. And as we go along, I'm going to pose some questions for you to think about. Uh, one of my favorite shows, and my kids really love Mythbusters. It's a one of a one of the great shows on television, talking about science and how you can apply that. 
And as we go through, I'm going to ask some common myths with regard to uh, horse management, and particularly pasture management, and uh, allow you to kind of think through those, and I'll give you kind of my take on that. All right, well, this one will be hopefully a relatively easy one. Uh, hopefully, you recognize that horses do eat Bermuda grass, they can do it quite well. Um, so, this one definitely is plausible. Uh, and I want to give just a bit of a history on this. I'm from Kentucky. Uh, this actually is in the central part of Kentucky. If you're familiar with where, uh, the uh, World Equestrian Games that were just held just a few months back, this property is about uh, a thousand yards or so away from where those uh, World Equestrian Games were held. And there is Bermuda grass. That horse is grazing Bermuda grass. And it just about drove the thoroughbred industry up there nuts to think that we were feeding grazing Bermuda grass, uh, grazing horses on Bermuda grass. But obviously they, they can do quite well. But there is a lot of concern about impaction. Impaction and other kinds of gastrointestinal problems in horses. So is that a myth or truth with regard to Bermuda grass? Is that something that really causes, is it Bermuda grass itself that causes impaction? Well, the answer to that is no, it's not Bermuda grass per se that's causing impaction and problems like that. There's a multiple, uh, multiple facets to this, okay? The very first thing that you need to understand is that the more fiber that is in that forage, regardless of how coarse that hay is or how fine that hay is, the more fiber that is in that forage, the more likely you're going to have a problem with impaction. So typically what we use as a rule of thumb here is less than 65% NDF. If you get your forage test report, one of the very first fiber columns or rows there is going to be on NDF. 65% just so happens to be that it works out that uh, on average, if you were to look at all the Bermuda grass samples that come into our lab, 65% is just a little bit higher than average, just a little bit, okay? So that means that there's a fair amount of Bermuda grass samples that are coming up way above 65%. This year, we had a large number of Bermuda grass samples, much higher than 65%. I've seen some as high as 75%, and, and that stuff is just, it's ditch field. Best thing for it is just to stick it out and, and uh, to stop some washing. Yes, sir? NDF is, is a fiber measurement. NDF is neutral detergent fiber. And, and all if you can imagine uh, that cell, okay, it's everything but the fiber. Or excuse me, it's all, it, you take out everything else except the fiber. So if it's 65%, that means 65% of whatever's there is the fiber that you're dealing with. And we break that down further, and, and I'll actually revisit uh, some of these quality metrics uh, a little bit later on. But that's the, that's the crude measurement or the overall measurement of fiber. That's different than other kinds of fiber uh, measurements that we do, and I'll, I'll come back and revisit that. So the second thing that really impacts, uh, pardon the pun, causes impaction in Bermuda grass uh, for uh, horses here is insufficient water availability. What do I mean by that? Well, this is typically a problem when we're dealing with horses that are boarded. They're only getting a little bit of water or a little bit of hay at a time. So that kind of goes along with the next one, which is insufficient mastication or chewing of the forage. If you allow horses to go out in a, and graze in a pasture, they will graze 17 to 18 hours per day. Now, when we put them up in the, into, for board, and we feed them once or twice a day, that's a big change in what that animal really is designed to do, okay? And so what happens is, is that animal's very hungry, it tries to take in quite a bit at one time, and it doesn't chew it very well. And if it doesn't chew it very well, then that masticate, that bolus of, of fiber, essentially that's moving through its gut, is going to have a higher chance of it actually clogging up the pipe somewhere along the line. Okay, so feed more often if possible. That's one way to, to help deal with that. And give them plenty of exercise. If they are stalled all the time, 
that's really when we start having problems with infection. Okay? So big, big issue there between all four of those. If you have problems with all four of those, you're going to have infection more than one. If you have a problem with just one of them, you may not have a problem, but you could. Okay, so that myth is definitely busted. We can use Bermuda All right, let me just kind of go over just some brief uh, um, comments about forage management in general. It is important, I think, for us to talk about forage management because in the state of Georgia, approximately 4 million acres uh, is, of forage crops are grown, and that's actually <coughs> about 50% uh, more than all of the other row crops combined. So this is a large managed land use. It is the largest managed land use if you set aside uh, forested acreages. I'm talking about forest beyond uh, um, tree farms. Okay. So very large managed acreage. 3.4 million of that's in pasture. Quite a bit of hay acreage as well. So again, all of the other uh, field crops combined. I may have misstated there, but it's a total of less than 3 million acres for all the other row crops combined. Uh, we have approximately a $2 billion direct impact. And guess what? Horses is one of the most impactful of those uh, industries. So it's really critical that we pay attention to how we utilize uh, our forage resource here. Of course, a lot of this is um, because of boarding. We've seen a large number of increase in boarding in the last 10 to 15 years. Um, and so these numbers fluctuate from year to year. This happens to be current as of 2008. It certainly is a uh, valuable asset to our economy. Now, the one thing about horse statistics, uh, population statistics, is they're hard to keep up with. Uh, they're, they're not tracked like dairy cattle numbers or beef cattle numbers or sheep numbers and that sort of thing. So uh, what I did was uh, I went back and looked in some of the archives and, and pulled up an article from the New York Times January of, of uh, 1886, there were actually uh, 108,000 horses in the state of Georgia. Now there were actually about that many more mules as well, because mules were the primary source of, of uh, horse fire, if you will, uh, back in those days. Now, anyone want to venture a guess as to the 2007 numbers? These are the most recent numbers that we have. 2007 numbers, just in the state of Georgia. 600,000. 600,000? Actually about 250,000, but if you look at Florida, which is our neighbor uh, to the south, they have a large area uh, uh, that's developing here, particularly with uh, thoroughbreds, and they're around 500,000. So a lot more now than what we ever had in, in history. Now as a, as a Kentucky guy, I have to really take exception to this uh, horse capital of the world uh, business that they, that they down in Ocala try to promote Lexington, Kentucky, the horse capital of the world. I don't care what they say. <laughs> All right. Um, just to, uh, just to, you know, just to emphasize the point that we do grow a lot of forages. And this is some alfalfa that's grown uh, down in Coffee County. Uh, we can grow a lot of good quality alfalfa in Georgia as well. You don't have to look elsewhere necessarily to find that. Uh, and, and, you know, there's a lot of bad quality stuff produced too. Don't get me wrong, but there are some really good producers out there, and, and this is one I just wanted to highlight. The key thing about Georgia's grasslands is very, very diverse. From north to south, from the mountains all the way down to the coast, we have a tremendous amount of diversity. Uh, in, in terms of grass species, we grow about 35 different forage species. In terms of legume species, we grow about 25 different forage species. So we have a large amount of diversity there. But when we start getting down to price tax for the horse industry, you know, they really are going to focus on the grasses. All of these other components are relatively minor uh, relative to the grass side of that. Okay, so that's the important part. If, you, if they're given this choice, that's what they're going to select. If we were to think about this also in terms of topography, okay, so if you're dealing with some topography challenges in your pastures, where is it that those horses are going to prefer to eat? So this comes into design as to how we uh, design our paddocks and where we're going to put what. So if we look at slope, we look at the spectrum here in terms of grass to browse, uh, and then in terms of how selective that animal is, uh, here are goats, here are sheep, here are cattle, and here is horses. 
So they much prefer to be on the, on the flat areas, the, the low line, uh, no slopes. They're very, very selective and they tend to focus on the grass species. Okay? So as we design our forage system, we have to keep that in mind. Now obviously the ideal is throughout the whole of the season, the whole of the year, we'd ideally like to have constant available forage out there. Well unfortunately, Mother Nature just doesn't work that way. Here's our Bermuda grass, our warm season perennials. Here's our winter annuals in terms of their distribution of forage yield. And then here's our cool season perennial grasses like fall fescue, orchard grass, and a few others that we might deal with. Now, you know, if we kind of put these together in some kind of a system and mix it all up, we get a pretty good uh, distribution across there. But, you know, what we have to do is pick and choose to try to maximize our forage availability. Tall fescue is one for us in the northern part of Georgia that really is a fit. And I'm going to revisit the issue of tall fescue uh, a little later on because it's, it's something that we need to manage appropriately. Uh, there are other things like hybrid Bermuda grasses. Um, even some of our clovers can have a fit there too. And, and when we start looking at things like uh, cereal rye and annual ryegrass for winter pastures, they can really help fill in a void for us in the winter months as well. But there is no such thing as a perfect ideal forage system. And in many cases, there's, there's especially in the horse side, there's often times where we can't just cannot produce enough on the land that we have for the number of animals that we have out there. Okay? So I'm going to try to, you know, talk with you about ways to actually get that as close to the ideal as we can, and and try to uh, you know manipulate the system so that we can do that. Now, as I mentioned, there are going to be a few diversions as we go along, and I'm a little bit of a history buff, and and what I like to do is go back in time and look at you know one of the most important periods of history in our in our country was the Civil War. And this is a picture of just kind of depicting all of the, the horsepower that really went into the, into the Civil War. And we oftentimes forget about the role that the horses played uh, during, uh, during the Civil War. If we uh, were to look back at some of the, the famous horses of the Civil War, everybody kind of remembers Traveler. Traveler is uh, uh, one of the most important horses of, of the Civil War. It was Robert E. Lee's uh, primary horse. It's actually its original name was Jeff Davis. Uh, so you can kind of imagine why he needed to change that. Uh, uh, he bought that from uh, in Greenbrier County, uh, what is now West Virginia. At that time it was Virginia. And of course after the war, uh, it kept with him. Uh, Trevor uh, was uh, a constant companion for him. But uh, when he went to uh, Washington College at that time, uh, he, as the president of that college, it, the horse got to a point that it was, it was really looking bad because as, as people would come by and visit with him, they would pluck a hair out of its tail or out of its mare, uh, mane, and, and it was really getting kind of uh, ratty looking over time. Uh, but they wanted a memento of, of travel, so it's kind of an interesting uh, story there. Uh, this is uh, uh, U.S. Grant, and I believe this, uh, this horse is named um, uh, Duke. Duke is his name. Uh, that was his primary in the in the Civil War as well. Um, he was actually uh, given to Grant after the Battle of Chattanooga, so a little bit of Georgia history there. Uh, he was given to him by a, a, another man named Grant, although it's no relation, uh, who also lived in St. Louis, Missouri. But uh, uh, he was a basically given to Grant as a, as a gift recognition of his uh, winning of the Battle of Chattanooga. Uh, so true Georgians in the audience probably would want to give a big boo and hiss to this fellow. This is uh, William Tecumseh Sherman. Uh, Sherman's famous or infamous march to the sea. This picture was taken uh, uh, aboard the, I believe that horse's name is Cincinnati. Uh, and Cincinnati was the son of a very famous racehorse at that time. Um, who uh, was the fastest thoroughbred racehorse at that time. And uh, it was uh, Sherman's primary uh, throughout the majority of the Civil War. Uh, this picture was taken in September of 1864, right? Yeah. So this was immediately prior to Sherman's march to the sea. Now, 
September of the year, and he's going to make his march to the sea. He makes it to Savannah before Christmas. That is the absolute worst time to try to keep forage in front of a horse. All right? Now, it's kind of interesting if you go back and look what those, those horses were fed. They were fed a ration of 14 pounds of hay, 12 pounds of grain. It was usually oats if they could find it. Uh, it might have been corn or something else. And any kind of pastures that they might have available to them. Again, fall of the year, very little forage out there in the pasture. Uh, in 1864, it was a severe drought year. They did not have a whole lot of uh, forage out there. So uh, they, they actually were, were rationed even beyond that. It was a much lower ration than what the standard ration was. But even at the standard ration, this is an energy deficit ration. And uh, what, I'm, what I'm driving at with all of this, I showed you all of that to show you this, which is uh, the NRC, which is the National Research Council, actually has their website set up where you can enter in a ration. Uh, you can tell it what kind of animal that you have, and you can enter in a ration, and you can get some feedback as to whether or not it actually is meeting the requirements of that horse. So just for kicks and grins, I threw in the, uh, uh, the, the 14 pounds of hay and 12 pounds of grain into this ration, and I know you can't see that from where you're at, but essentially what that what this shows is, is that they were about 30% deficient in energy. And that was considering a medium workload. Those, those that were really working hard were having a, a real problem keeping up with their adaptive energy deficit. And so it's no wonder that so many horses died during that period, not just from uh, bullet wounds and from problems, but also from, uh, uh, from starvation, really. Okay, let's get back to some real uh, uh, modern and useful information. So up in this area of the, of the state, our primary pasture is going to be a tall fescue and some common Bermuda grass will be in there as well. Uh, Bermuda grass hay fields will still be primarily, although as we get further north, we're gonna enter, get into a lot more tall fescue hay fields. And then we still have quite a few sun, uh, uh, winter annuals, particularly in the uh, winter months, annual ryegrass and rye. And then uh, some legumes and forbs that we use in the, in the pastures as well. White clover, a uh, little bit of red clover, a little bit of alfalfa. And we'll talk about where each of those fit and some that absolutely don't fit in uh, horse pastures. Uh, this is not relevant to most of you all, but in South Georgia, it's just a little bit different. Primarily Bermuda grass, a little bit of a hay grass as well in that system. All right, let's step through the uh, warm season perennials. Again, the Bermuda grass is here. Um, there are major differences between common Bermuda grass, the seeded Bermuda grasses, excuse me, and hybrid Bermuda grasses. Hybrid Bermuda grasses are almost all of those have been uh, developed in Tipton, although there's a number of others that are out there as well. Yeah. Almost all of those have to be established from sprigs and to be vegetatively established, uh, not seeded. They typically are very drought tolerant overall, very aggressive, very persistent. They require a substantial amount of fertility. Okay, to keep them in stand, to keep them performing at peak, they require lots of nitrogen, lots of potassium, and a lot of other uh, nutrients as well. Okay, let me uh, let me uh, step on some toes here. What is the best Bermuda grass variety for horse hay? What is the best Bermuda grass variety for horse hay? Is it Alicia hay, Coastal, Tip the Forty Four, Tip the Eighty Five? or none of the above. Coastal? You gotta vote for coastal. Okay. Coastal's the obvious one, but it must be E. <laughs> <laughs> My reputation proceeds. It is E. <laughs> and what I want to emphasize here is that if we go back to that very first discussion I had with regard to impaction as a prime example of that. The most important thing is how much fiber is in there, not necessarily how coarse the texture is or how fine the texture is. Any variety that we feed, if we cut it at the proper timing, we will not have problems with having too much fiber. Okay? Harvest, maturity at harvest is the number one by far factor that affects forage quality. We can talk about varieties and, and their preference all we want, 
but they're really, at the end of the day, there's not that much difference between varieties. There is difference between management. So here's a prime example. Here's some common Bermuda grass, and this is 50 and 85 Bermuda grass. Vastly different in terms of, of uh, coarseness and texture. But actually, this 50 and 85 is more digestible, not only in, in cattle, but also in horses, more digestible than, than uh, common or just about any of the other uh, Bermuda grass varieties that are out there. Okay, but if you cut it wrong, it's going to be just as bad as something else. It all comes down to cutting. cutting. Varieties definitely do differ in quality, they differ in vigor, in growth rate, and of course in coarseness and in drying rate. Now that is one of the aspects of Tiffin 85 and some of those that are more coarse, is that they may actually take a little bit more time to dry down. Now there's also usually more forage out there and it takes longer for more forage to dry down. So uh, yield is not independent of that. I want to highlight an extensive publication that we have called Selecting a Forage for Grass Variety. And we go through each of the varieties and what are their attributes? What are their positive and negative as aspect, aspects? Uh, this is a table that I'm just uh, going to gloss over, but it gives you an idea of the kinds of materials that are the information that's there. Now, there is a difference in palatability. What do we mean by palatability? We can't exactly ask a horse if it likes it or not. We have to kind of observe a little bit. But now, just because we observe a difference in what they accept, or what they prefer to eat in a side-by-side -side trial, does not necessarily mean that they're going to do better on one versus another. Okay? But this is some work that uh, uh, Gary Huesner, who many of you may know, uh, did several years ago. You looked at coastal Tipton 44 and Tipton 78, all of those were equally acceptable in terms of uh, uh, animals eating, horses eating. Uh, subsequent work, he also looked at Russell, and that essentially was as equal to those as well. Uh, we would also categorize Alicia in the same category in terms of palatability or acceptability. Now, this assumes now that all of those hays were harvested at the same maturity. 28 days or 25 days or 30 days or they were all close in terms of maturity. Now these others, 1585 and Coast Cross, are more coarse. They are less acceptable. In other words, they're less palatable. But again, they are higher in quality as a general rule at the same maturity. So uh, they actually don't need to eat as much of those. And that is not independent of how much their intake is going to be. Because horses are different from cattle. Horses actually will consume at a rate that's, uh, that's very similar to how digestible that forage is. Okay, it's actually inversely related. Okay, let me just point out this data is from Tipton, but we have this data from all the way from Calhoun, Griffin, Athens, all the way down to uh, Tipton, uh, variety trial data. And I just want to point out the differences in yields here between these different ones, and I'm going to go through these all real quickly. Okay, I don't have Alicia in this particular trial. This was done by the ARS station down in Tipton. Alicia generally will uh, yield somewhere between Tipton 44 and Coastal. Okay, so that as, a, as a benchmark, it's going to be very similar to those. But notice here the, the yields of some of the better, higher quality forages. Uh, Tipton 85, this is a new one, Coast Cross 2, both are coarse but both are actually higher in yield and in digestibility. Uh, these yellow bars actually represent the hay grass. You won't have much of that up here. Uh, then you'd also have some of these seeded Bermuda grasses up here. From time to time I get questions about these seeded Bermuda grasses. And they, they do have a fit, but usually you want to establish those on just small acreage because you're giving up a lot of yield. You're probably giving up as much as you know 40% of the, of the yield potential of a particular site. Okay, let me start uh, talking about some that are on the don't waste your time list. <laughs> there are a few that for a horse owner is just not, it's just not in the cards. And that includes all of our native warm season grasses. Mm -hmm. If that's your primary forage source for horses, that is not going to cut it. However, now they're good to have on the farm. They're actually uh, really good for habitat and particularly for, song, uh, for uh, uh, grassland birds, songbirds, 
But uh, in this case, for horse pastures, this is not a good choice. <coughs> Warm season annual grasses, as a general rule, are also not a good choice for horses. Okay, I'm going to just go completely through those and skip them all together. There's a little bit more information in your handout about those if you are interested and if you have other animals, other ruminant animals that are in your uh, operation. But for horses, my best advice to you on that is just not to worry about uh, the, uh, the warm season animals. The only exception to that would be actually crabgrass, believe it or not. And we'll come back to crabgrass in just a little bit. Okay, cool season perennial grasses. Tall fescue is probably the most uh, important cool season uh, forage grass that we have. So we have another question for you. Tall fescue should be avoided as a component in horse pasture. True or false? False. Okay. I'm going to say actually that this is plausible in certain times of the year. Okay, and I'll go into more detail on that. Okay. Tall fescue is the most widely used forage grass in the whole of the U.S. It covers from this area of the country all the way up into um, uh, up close to Michigan and that area of the U.S. and as far west as Oklahoma and, uh, and uh, Nebraska and Kansas and places like such. But the problem with it is, of course, is that it has this, this uh, fungus that lives inside of the plant. And from an agronomic perspective, um, of yield and performance and persistence, it's very positive impact on that. And unfortunately, it produces alkaloids. And alkaloids are nitrogen-containing compounds like caffeine, like nicotine, those sorts of things. Uh, this one happens to be somewhat similar to uh, LSD. Even trials of ch children of the 60s. <laughs> you know what LSD is, right? Okay. Very similar kinds of uh, things, and actually it's, it's a little bit different, but it has some of the same kinds of effects. One of the big things it does is actually constricts blood vessels. And that vasoconstriction is actually what causes problems with circulation to the hooves, to the tails, and also can induce some of the problems that we have with red bag and, and dystocia during foam. So, a study back in the mid-80s, this work was actually done in Clemson, and they made some observations of some, some horses in their last uh, uh, bit of their gestation cycle, and they noticed that those horses that had been grazing on indefined infected tall fescue and an average of 27 days longer gestation cycle than those grazing on end of bite free tall fescue. So this was the first red flag that started coming up. So we dug a little deeper here. The incidence of stillborn foals, very high relative to end of bite free. Aglactic mares, aglactic being that the mares don't produce enough milk, much higher incidence there. Retained placentas, big problem there. Uh, mares being rebred. This is the opposite. You want to see a high number here. Uh, in this case, uh, it took a few extra cycles there to get those animals rebred. So, what we recommend as a general rule of thumb is for raven mares, those mares that are actually um, about 60 to 90 days prior to folding, remove them from endophyte infected tall fescue patterns. Okay? This is uh, important to also remember is that it's not just in the, in the pasture, it can also be in the hay. So the hay also needs to be withheld if it's suspected of having uh, the endophyte in it. Now, how do you suspect that you have endophyte in your pastures or in your hay? I can almost guarantee you that if you go out and you find a tall fescue plant in your pastures or in any fields in this part of Georgia, I can almost guarantee you it's going to have in the fights in it. Okay? It does not persist very well in our environment without the end of fight. So assume that you have it. Unless you have planted something like a max Q or an end of fight free and you know that you don't have it, assume that you have it. Even low levels of fescue can cause severe problems. Okay? We don't know what that magic number is. It's probably less than 20%. But even if you have low levels out there, you need to avoid it. Now they will selectively 
raise other things other than this uh, if they're in a pasture. Uh, but it, it can be fun. The most important thing here in order to be able to anticipate foaling is to keep good records as to when that animal should be uh, coming in foaling. Okay, so some advances that actually the University of Georgia was very instrumental in was the development of the novel endophyte technology. Novel endophytes are naturally occurring endophytes. They just be, happen to be found in Mediterranean climates and also in New Zealand and Australia. And these, these particular novel endophytes uh, give all of the persistence benefits of the wild type, but they, they don't produce any of the alkaloids. And so some, some researchers from UGA and Ag Research, which is a, a research outfit from, the, from New Zealand, uh, developed this and put it into uh, Jessup, called Best Cube, which is now known as and marketed as Jessup Max Q. Uh, they just celebrated their 10th year anniversary of having this out on the market. The proven technology, it's definitely, it definitely does work. <laughs> it is persistent, uh, but it does not have the toxicosis problems. It's more expensive, but you get what you pay for. Okay? It is valuable. Other things on the do not waste your time list. Orchard grass, in your pastures, don't waste your time. You might have two or three plants of, tall, of orchard grass out there in your pastures, but don't go out there planting orchard grass in pastures, even in North Georgia. Okay? You get up into uh, Kentucky, and really even in Kentucky it's a problem, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and those areas, you can get orchard grass to last a little bit longer. Now it's okay for a hay field, if you want to grow orchard grass hay, it can grow quite well. It only lasts two or three years, but you can get it to grow and, and do quite well for that. Timothy, in the state of Georgia, don't even think about it. It's not going to last in Georgia. Okay? Perennial ryegrass, another one. This is not annual ryegrass, this is perennial ryegrass. Okay? And, and, and in practice, it actually turns into a very expensive annual ryegrass because it doesn't stick around but for just one year. Okay? So don't, uh, don't get be fooled by that. Kentucky bluegrass, we might have a few plants of Kentucky bluegrass <coughs> up in the mountains, particularly over around the, the uh, limestone area and over around Sand Mountain, we'll have some uh, Kentucky bluegrass up there, but uh, it's not something we need to be planting. All right, legumes. Why don't we even think about legumes for the standpoint and for the horses? Because they're not going to eat a whole lot of them if they're given the choice. And, but what little they do get actually can be a quite a good benefit to them in terms of quality. We look at legume quality in terms of digestible dry matter relative to many of the other species that we have. They are much higher in digestibility uh, and much higher in quality overall. Now, of course, if we're talking about an animal that has some very high uh, nutrient needs, in terms, especially in terms of energy, uh, we probably need to be thinking about uh, about our legumes, alfalfa, uh, and some of our other clovers. Again. The selectivity that they have and the focus here on grass is going to really, you know, in a pasture setting, it's not going to add a lot to their diet. But by the same standpoint, they do have an ability to help dilute the effect of the toxicosis in the endophyte. Uh, if, I mean, if, I got that backwards here. They, they don't necessarily dilute it, but they actually improve the quality of the pasture and actually improve the performance of the animal. It's not a dilution effect, it's a, it's a quality effect. Okay, so it does improve the, the animal performance, but it's not because it's diluting it. Now, the biggest thing that we see as a value of the legumes there is their contribution of nitrogen. And they fix quite a bit of nitrogen out of the atmosphere and contribute that to the soil. Uh, and it's also a time to release source of nitrogen too, because it takes time for that to break down, and it's a very uh, good timing with regard to the grass growth as well. Uh, these numbers are actually a little bit out of date because I'm using 45 cents per pound of nitrogen. You can pretty much uh, mark that up to about 60 to 65 cents per pound of nitrogen now. So just redo the math here, but you can see uh, white clover here, very conservative estimates actually for a full season, 100 to 150 pounds of nitrogen. Uh, these are going to contribute quite a bit of value in terms of nitrogen to your pastures. Okay? That means you don't have to add another 100 to 150 pounds of nitrogen to get full performance out of your grasses. 
Uh, one of the things that I would really like to draw to your attention, particularly for horses, is a variety called Durana. Durana white clover is what we call an intermediate white clover. It's relatively short growing, extremely persistent under intensive grazing. If we're out there and grazing it really tight, Durana is going to do extremely well and give you pretty good yields and persistence. Here's a situation in Calhoun where uh, on the left hand side they used Durana, they used a, another competitor on the right hand side and after a couple of years you can see the contribution of the clovers there relative to uh, the situation on the right hand side where there's very little left out there. Now let me spend just a second talking about red clover because occasionally we'll get some questions about this. This is red clover not crimson clover. Okay? Red clover is a short-lived perennial legume. Uh, it's probably more common in this area of the state than other areas of the state. The problem with uh, red clover is that um, if you ever see red clover, it's very easily identified because it has hairs, trichomes, all over the stem, all over the leaves. And those trichomes actually are colonized by a particular type of fungus. And that particular fungus uh, is known as black patch. What happens is, is that fungus actually produces a compound called slapramine, and that may uh, ring a bell. It actually causes excess saliva production, okay? so it gives them the slobbers. Right? It's, it, you know, it's nothing necessarily wrong with the red clover that's causing it. It's that infection by that fungus. Now there are also a few varieties out of red clover out there that do not have pubescence on them. Now, uh, one in particular called Freedom. Freedom is a variety of red clover that does not have that pubescence. It would be safe to feed to, uh, to horses, uh, even as a, as a hay crop. Other than just a lot of slobber, we get that a lot yep. here coming up pretty soon. Yep. Um, what effect, other than just looking gross and messy, is it having on the horse? It just is a nuisance. Yeah, it is. Okay, um, especially if you get out the path of the pasture with them, they're rubbing up against you or your fairy. Or if you're fairy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 You bring bar soap, you can have a shower. Right. Okay, let me sp uh, spend some time talking about our <coughs> season annuals. A few of these, uh, oats being one, I'm just going to fly through this because that really is not one that we would recommend. Rye. On the other hand, is one that we could use from time to time in horse pastures. The nice thing about it is that it's very tolerant of soil acidity. Uh, it has very early maturity. It's going to be growing quite well at this time of the year. Not, not much else is going to be growing well at this time of the year. Uh, excellent cold tolerance, so it does even it does well even up here. Um, rye does have a tendency to mature extremely quickly, and it will go ahead practically within a week's time frame. So it will get away from you. So just be careful about uh, using it in your pastures. Uh, so you may have to focus grazing on it at this time of the year to keep it from getting away from you. Uh, here are some varieties that may be to help to you. I realize I'm going through a lot of this fast, but just trust me, I'm going to hit the things that are most important. And, and if you want to go back and ask questions or uh, if you want to go back and read this uh, material later on, uh, that maybe it will help you. Yes, ma'am. So you think right, do you still recommend doing it in the fall? Yes, yes. All of these that I'm talking about now, all of the cool season annual grasses need to be planted in the fall of the year. They would be typically in this area of the state planted between September 15th and October 15th, preferably. They can be planted into prepared seed bed uh, after a crop or something like that, or on top of your Bermuda grass pasture or on top of your uh, whatever pasture that you have out there. But I would not recommend planting these cool season annuals with tall fescue. The competition is such that you're not going to get much out of either one. So this would be where if you've got a lot of common Bermuda grass that's infiltrated into your pasture, this would be something to start thinking about. Uh, wheat, again, is one I'm going to fly through because that really doesn't have much of a place either. Annual ryegrass, however, does have a, a nice fit for it. Very uh, tolerant of close grazing, uh, very good yields out of it. 
Uh, it's a later maturing species. It's going to uh, mature about a month before tall fescue will mature. Okay? So that kind of gives you a timeline there to think about. If you go back and look at those forage distribution curves that I showed you earlier, you can get an idea as to where this is going to fit. Very good cold tolerance, but it is going to interfere with Bermuda grass greeno. Now, if you just got common Bermuda grass, you're probably not worried about that. But if you're doing this in your hay fields, you're going to have a problem. Okay, so don't put this where you've got the new grass hay fields. Uh, a long list of varieties here. Uh, I won't go into the details there, but any of those we would recommend. Uh, pick one of these that are, are uh, either designated as with a pea or Piedmont or mountain, or avoid any of these that are listed for, uh, for a coastal plain for this area to stay. Just some raw data here with regard to the uh, summary of torch quality and expected yields. So, now that I've covered that, I'm going to just give you my perfect forage system for horses. In my opinion, and this is, you know, uh, everybody's got their own opinion about this, but this is my perfect horse pasture. It would, in this area of the state, be primarily based on tall fescue. At least 60% of the area needs to be cool season species. And tall fescue being a predominant part of that. Bermuda grass being that other 40, 30 to 40%. Okay. And that could include common Bermuda grass, that could include some hybrid Bermuda grasses if you have the area to support that. I like having some white clover out there. And again, the clover is not going to contribute a lot to the yield, it is going to improve quality. And it is going to improve the nitrogen cycle there in that, in that pasture and reduce your total fertilizer. And then ryegrass. Annual ryegrass uh, is, is one of those things I think really helps bridge our gaps. We can use some of those other things too, but you know, if we have this kind of combination, uh, that's probably going to work out best. Questions? Yes? Um, okay, you said golf is going to be set before September 15th to October. Grass. So when do you plant the other stuff? So, um, Bermuda grass, let's start, we'll just go right down the list. Tall fescue is going to be just like uh, the others. It's going to be uh, late September, early October. And it can go into late October if necessary. Bermuda grass needs to be, if it's going to be seeded, it needs to be seeded in April or May. Preferably May. Mm -hmm. Yes. Or drill, you can also drill it. Uh, but again, Bermuda grasses, the best Bermuda grasses are those that are actually vegetatively spring in, you bring in vegetative material, fill it in, and it'll take off. White clover is also a fall planted species. So, excuse me, late, uh, late September, early October. White clover can also be established right now. What we call frost seeding. Actually, probably in this year, it probably would have been better to do that in late January or early February. Hopefully, we've turned the corner on the winter and we're not getting as much frost. But what happens is if you've got some berry areas in your pasture, if you go out there and broadcast it in, in uh, January, February, the freezing and thawing action of the soil will actually draw that seed down in and it'll be at the perfect spot. So th that one actually has two windows of opportunity. And the ryegrass, again, that would be uh, September, early October, and, and even into later October if necessary. I told you I was going to come back to crabgrass. Crabgrass is not necessarily one that I would recommend planting, although there are varieties out there and there are situations where we would recommend planting crabgrass. But crabgrass is going to be in your pasture. Whether we like it or not, it's going to be there. But I think what we should do is actually like that it's there because it's going to be by far higher in nutritional value than, than the Bermuda grass that's out there at the same time. Okay. Much more digestible, uh, much more palatable even than, than Bermuda grass. Okay. So crabgrass is a valuable part of the pasture. Okay, now I'm really going to step on some toes here. No, I'm, nobody in here would do this, so I'm going to, I'm going to think highly of you here. The best stocking rate as a rule of thumb for horse pastures in Georgia would be typically one medium sized horse per acre. Plausible, confirmed, or myth busted. 
So I'll kind of give that and away. Huh? It would have to be a super duper pasture, yes. And you would have to be doing some really good rotational grazing to be able to do that. Truth is, uh, typically, and I think I've got this in a future slide here, but um, well, maybe I've done Probably, if I were to give you an average, the average for good growth on the pasture and to keep it from looking like a parking lot, uh, probably the best stocking rate is about one medium sized horse for every two and a half to three acres. Why do I say that? Because inevitably you're going to have trees there, inevitably you're going to have overgrazing there, uh, you're going to have some areas that are going to be grazed harder than others. Okay, and as we go through, this will become a little bit clearer of what I'm trying to say here. There is greatly, it's really difficult to produce that kind of forage under under shade and under high intensity grazing. Okay? Especially for our warm season species, they do not tolerate sunshine or uh, shade. They have to have lots of sun. Even our cool season species, the number one factor that affects their growth is solar radiation. How much sun did they get? Okay. They are solar cells. You got to remember that. They're taking solar energy and turning it into sugar and carbohydrates that, they, that the animal can use. Okay, grazing behavior. Horses spend on average between 14 and a half to 17 hours per day grazing. So that accounts for about 70% of the day. Um, most of that grazing is going to be around dawn and before sunset. They will be grazing in, in extended bouts throughout the day. They will consume somewhere between two and two and a half percent of their body weight per head per day uh, that they're out there. Now, some, some horses, depending on their nutritional needs, may need more than that. But as a general rule, that's, uh, that's a good rule of thumb. Grazing time is going to be definitely altered by conditions in terms of heat stress, insect problems, uh, you know, any kind of stress that's going on out there, they're going to have some difficulties uh, uh, spending as much time as they really would like to do. Now, here's something that uh, we, we need to really understand. Low forage quality equals a high passage rate, a higher amount of forage intake, a lot more wastage. If the quality of the forage is low, they're actually going to eat more of it to get the same amount of energy. It's counterintuitive, it doesn't make sense until you really understand that their, their biggest uh, advantage there is that they can pass that material through them relatively quickly to get it the, the easily available energy out of it. Okay. So this is different than, than, than beef cattle. And we also have a large amount of recreational grazing and, and social grazing as well. I'll come back to that in a minute. In terms of what I mean by social and rec 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 recreation. They tend to graze in three to seven extended bouts per day. So they'll be out there for a long period of time. Uh, they'll go out and then they'll sit under the shade for a little while or whatnot and come back. Uh, they are relatively slow uh, in terms of grazing. Uh, bite rate is relatively slow compared to other animal classes that we deal with sometimes. Uh, these are just again for your kind of information. Their grazing objectives are multiple, not just nutritional needs, but they want to maintain a relatively full gut the entirety of the time. They also have a lot of exercise and activity that they're trying to do out there too. Yes, sir. You made the statement the medium size horse approximately 1100 pounds or two and a half to three acres. Yep. I guess how would you begin to adjust that two and a half to three acres depending on the horse size? Exactly. Because in terms of a percent of their body weight, they're going to be taking in the same uh, percent. It's going to be a different quantity total, but it's going to be the same percent. Exactly. Okay. Now, that's assuming that uh, the majority of their forage and the dry matter intake for the day is coming from pasture. If you're feeding a lot of hay, you can you can go with a higher stocking. But hay is usually three to four times more expensive than pasture is, so it's a trade-off. You, know, you can you can put them out, you can keep them on concrete all the time if you want. 
but you got a cart all the pieces. So it's it's a trade off. You're looking at what is the most cost effective way of doing it. Okay, this is what I mean by selective or recreational grazing. We end up with these areas in pastures a lot of times that are what we call lawns. They are grazed down as tight as this, con this uh, carpet on the concrete. Then you have other areas that are roughs. What we call roughs, which are just where the forage has gotten away and gotten more mature. There is no rhyme or reason to this that anybody that I know of has figured out. Okay? There is some implication with regard to particular stallions, where they've defecated, and, and that sort of thing. But as a general rule, there's not a whole lot of rhyme or reason as to uh, why those patches are there. But once they become there, they will always be there unless you exercise some kind of management over them. Okay. Such as bush hopping or. Such as or rotational grazing. The only solution to this is to rotational graze. And this farmer has actually begun to do a little bit of that. The key with horses in rotational grazing, and hopefully we'll get a chance to go back to that again, is to move them rapidly. Graze a little bit, move them to another pile. Raise a little bit, move them to another paddock. You keep doing it. Moving them rapidly is the key to avoiding this situation. Because what's happening here is that they're allowing this to just go mature. Because all of this stuff, what little bit that they can get there, is extremely good quality. It can do. So bush hogging then or something, maybe animals, bush hogging animals, fertilizer, that will help you with that. Not unless you have a uh, uh, one of those things that they go and call greens with. Get it down to the same height as that. The only way is you'll be able to do that is to get it down to that height. It's just not going to work. But rotation, I don't know about that. But that's just not practical in a lot of operations. Yep, I completely understand. Okay, that, but I'm just saying that this is what's going to happen. <laughs> oh, it, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's the only thing we can do about it. Is, is what we do. Um. And there's really not a whole lot that we can do to improve. I mean, mowing will help some, but it's, that's also very time consuming and expensive, and it's really not going to make that big of a difference. Uh, rotational grazing is one of those things that, that will help, and, and you know, a little bit of rotation helps a lot, actually. Um, and, and I don't like the term necessarily rotational grazing, I prefer the term of rational grazing. Why I use rational, why I'm, what I mean by that is that in both senses of the words. One is that we're actually rationing out the need on a daily or a weekly or a periodic basis. Rationing out. But we're also giving it some rational thought. We're giving some thought to how we're doing this and allocating a certain amount uh, based on what we know about the situation now. Let me, let me kind of go through just some ideas here and concepts and theory and then we'll come back and really put this into practice. So if we think about how forage mass accumulates over time, and this is for just, let's say, Bermuda grass, for, just for kicks and grins. Um, we start out relatively low early on in the regrowth period and by day 30 or 35 we've got quite a bit of forage out there and then it begins to slow back down a little bit. All right? So let's step through this. There's a uh, uh, what we call the lag phase, that early phase of growth, a relatively low rate of growth. Then we have a linear, excuse me, or even an exponential, a very rapid phase of growth. This is where we really want to keep the forage, growing as fast as we possibly can. Uh, then we have this tail end here that we call the stationary. Now you may be more familiar with this as early vegetative, late vegetative, Reproduction. That's kind of the maturity with which that crop is going. So let me ask you a few questions as we go through here. At what point in time, on this scale of days here, at what point in time is that forage growing the fastest? 15 to 30. 15 to 30. Okay. So its peak is actually right here in the middle of that, right about 24, 25 days. After 24 or 25 days, the growth rate begins to slow down. Okay. Now, why is this important? We're trying to keep this growth rate as rapid as we possibly can. If we keep it down in this area all the time, we're never going to get much more than a third or so of the capacity of what we could get out of that pasture. 
Okay, so by rotating it and giving it some rest and enough time to accumulate more forage, we're allowing it to actually produce a lot more pasture. Oftentimes, three times as much pasture as what we get in many of our horse pastures. Okay, so this is just a, a, a growth curve. Um, so that's that's showing you the rate growth rate actually. You can see right here about 22, 23 days or so. That's where that maximum is. Okay. When will the forage quality be the highest? When will forage quality along this continuum here? When will it be the highest? Yep. Right about here is where it's going to be the highest. Shorter the better in terms of quality. However, we're not getting much yield at that point. And that's why those horses like to keep those roughs, I mean the, the lawns, down at that height. When is the forage quality yield going to be highest? In other words, when we harvest that or when we assuming hay here, or grazing really, when should we graze it to get the most yield of high quality forage? About, about 30 days or so. About 28 to 30 days on this particular curve. Somewhere in that neighborhood is when you're going to keep it in that growth rate, the high growth rate as long as possible, uh, but keep it from getting overly mature and getting very indigestible. If we if we are cutting on a uh, four to six week interval for Bermuda grass, preferably a four week interval, um, here at 28 days or so, we're consistently able to do that. We're going to have much more highly digestible yield, digestible yield per acre, than than if we were way later. So in other words, we're producing more forage that's actually digestible. We're producing less manure. Because the more, the longer that you wait, the more indigestible is there, and all that indigestible dry matter is just more manure. Okay. So we have this paradox of digestibility, palatability versus yield, and there's this this relationship between the two that may go down, the digestibility goes down with time. So we need to focus on uh, getting it back before it gets into this mature stage in the red zone. Okay, so when should I, preferably, or in the ideal world, when should I start grazing? Well, we just said somewhere in that 28 to 30 day window would be ideal. Now that's going to be some you know, pretty good material out there. But, uh, and we can adjust that based on you know, what our target height is and target quality is. But more importantly, we need to know when we need to stop grazing the paddock. Okay? Write this down in big, bold letters. Grass grows grass. Okay? The more leaf area that you have, the more grass that's out there will grow more grass. Okay? If you don't have grass out there and it looks like this floor, you will not be able to grow grass. Grass grows grass. Yes? Is there anywhere on that chart as far as you uh, that, um, let me revisit that issue in just a little bit because uh, there, there's a lot of talk about laminitis and, and it, it, there, there are some issues with that. We have less of a problem with that than, than other uh, other areas, but I, let me revisit that and talk about it in more specific terms. Uh, I, I think I do have something in there that, that will answer that question. Okay, efficiencies of uh, grazing mechanized harvest. Okay, let's compare different forage systems and see how efficient that they really are. Let's start with uh, continuous stocking here. The continuous stocking is you have one or two horses, one or two packs. That's all. They're, they've got the full run of the farm. There's no gates. There's no controlling of the grazing. It's like the kind of farming that I was used to when I was a kid. You turned open the gates and you let them have at it. Okay? The problem with continuous stocking is that if we were to estimate how much of the forage that is produced there, or what is capable of being produced there, only 30 to 40 percent of what is produced there, or capable of being produced there, only 30 or 40 percent will make it into the mouth of the animal. Now think about that for just a minute. What other industry 
would we tolerate a 70% inefficiency? You know, none of our agricultural crops would, would survive at that rate. We wouldn't leave 70% of our cotton out there. Uh, we, we really need to get away from this kind of problem, particularly in the, in the horses. Now, I would say that this data is actually uh, rather conservative with regard to horses. That number is probably more like 10 to 15 percent for a lot of the horse pastures that are extremely overgrazed. Okay. Now, I'm not trying, I'm, nobody in here does that, so I'm just preaching to a crowd, I know, but um, this, this is a, a different situation. Now, if we, if we just split those one or two paddocks up into three to four paddocks, we can almost double that efficiency just in that practice alone. If we're rotating once every three or four days. If we go to a moderate rotation where we're moving more rapidly, uh, then we actually can increase that efficiency even more. I'm not saying that we need to get to this daily uh, strip grazing kind of approach. We do that in some animals like dairy cattle and stocker cats and that sort of thing. But, you know, we can get some very efficient utilization especially if we compare that to our mechanized harvest systems. And this hay, not, hay line up here is one that oftentimes people get really uh, uh, an eye-opening experience, to say the least. I would venture a guess to say that in the state of Georgia, the average efficiency is about 50%. In other words, for every 100 pounds of forage that's produced in most hay fields in the state of Georgia, Probably about 50% of it, only about 50% of it makes it into the mouth of the end. There's that much inefficiency between the losses in the field, but especially during storage, during um, feed. We have a large amount of hay loss there. I'll revisit that in a little bit. Side of the green chop, we don't do any, much of that at all for uh, the horses. By the way, you can actually feed bale silage to horses. It is not a problem. I do it in Europe all the time. It is safe to do. Believe it or not, it is safe to do. Baled silage is, um, is actually wet hay that's baled and then wrapped in plastic to exclude the oxygen. And so it actually ferments. It goes through a pickling process. It ferments in that bale. It actually comes out smelling real, if it's done right, it comes out smelling real sweet. And uh, it takes the sugar that's in that and actually converts it into uh, a stabilized, stabilizing acid that actually keeps it from uh, deteriorating. Very safe to, to feed the, the horses. And actually, the horse in the gastrointestinal tract, uh, it goes through this, a very similar process to extract the energy out of that material. So, well, that you will find some of it around, probably not as much around in this area of the state as you do in other areas. This one looks like big giant marshmallows. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Giant marshmallows. White bales on the side of the river. That's what you're saying. I didn't, I didn't mean to go off on a tangent there, but it's a question I get a lot of. When you talk about rotation, though, you're saying we're taking the animal completely off, not put a different horse. Because I, yes. a lot of times people will say, well, if you change horse to a different pasture, this horse may like this grass and it may eat in different areas. Yeah, no, I'm talking about taking. Totally off. If you've got three horses out there, take all three of them and put them into. They'll still, I mean, they'll, they'll have, if you just move one horse, you would end up with the same kind of pattern that you're talking about. Uh, the bottom of the data here, I, this is just for your reference, but this is the target end grazing height for the different species that we, we talked about. And the recommended time at which they need to rest in between grazings. I'm going to come back to this rest period in just a little bit. Now, what happens if we have those horses out there, a mob of horses staying out in that paddock for too long? There's no grass. There's no grass. We're all the way back down here, right? We stay down here. And that's what we see on, on the surface, but the, more, the big problem is, is what's underneath it. Okay, let's go back to that lawn and run. You know, we get a good heavy rain, uh, rain uh, fall event. You're going to see a lot of soil being washed off of those areas. Not going to much going to be moving off of that area, but a lot of soil going to be moving off of those lawns. 
And, you know, we have some major problems with this. Our folks with NRCS, I hope they uh, would, uh, would agree with this. Maybe this is not a problem up in this area of the state. But the majority of, of calls that come in complaining about runoff water issues and, and uh, uh, poor management practices with regard to pasture management have to do with the horse industry. I'm not trying to sit up here with a wagon finger in anybody's face. I'm just a state fact. We have a problem in the horse industry. We need to address this. If it's not addressed, somebody is going to step in and address it for us, and we're not going to like what they're going to post. Okay. So I'll get off my soapbox because it is a problem and it's affecting all of us the good ones, the good actors, and the bad actors. Okay, so if you have a forage out there, you graze it or cut it. And the regrowth begins, what actually happens here is those roots begin to die back. People don't realize this, but those roots won't just stay there and live and wait for that forage to grow back on top. It's going to die back. Those roots, a lot of times, is the, uh, the savings account for that grass. It's going to remobilize those resources to put on some, some more growth. Okay? But if you before it has a chance to grow back again, if you go back out there and graze it or cut it again, those roots die back even more. Okay, so what we're really trying to do with this rational grazing idea is to give that forage adequate rest so that it actually can redevelop that root system and we can get the cycle going such that we get good vigorous growth. The more root system that you have, the better regrowth potential that you have. The faster in which it will regrow too. Uh, this is just some points on this. I, I won't go into detail here. The key point to realize here is these fine roots that are doing a lot of the work will die whenever the um, forage is removed. Okay. Most popular question that I get in, the, in a drought here is my hay fields are green, but my pastures are brown. And the reason being is, is that those pastures never have gotten any taller than that right there where the hay fields were at least allowed to regrow a little bit. They may, they may not be growing much in the drought, but they'll at least be green because the root system is getting down to some, some uh, water and nutrient resources there. So that grazing system that's out there, this little forage grass that we're trying to get to grow is having to compete with all those other things that are out in that pasture that that horse will not eat. Now what has a competitive advantage there? Certainly not our little carpet in here. And by the way, whatever you see on the top row is usually, for all of, all intents and purposes, is mirrored in the root growth. So if your grass is that tall, that means the majority of your roots are that tall. Okay. All right. It also affects the weed competition, as I illustrated earlier, those things that the, the animals won't eat. Um, and I'll just listen to those for your reference. If you do have a specific work with a weed problem, work with your county agent, with Bob, with Steve, with, with Ricky, or whoever it might be to uh, help solve that problem. Okay, let me go on just briefly talk about some soil issues. One of the big ones is soil pH. Our, native, our soils are natively relatively low in soil pH. Typically, uh, native soil pH for us is going to be somewhere around 5, 6, 5, 7 or so. If we're dealing with a relatively neutral soil pH, here are root systems growing in that and they're relatively well developed. Now this happens to be from a broadleaf plant, but the same would be true for uh, grasses. Grasses respond very similarly to this. If we get down below, especially down below 5.5, this actually begins to occur at about pH of 5.8. If we get down there, then we have some real problems with the root system developing. It actually is some aluminum that becomes soluble in the soil. It burns the tip ends of the, of the roots. So, you know, I tell folks all the time in the fine print in my diploma, it says that every time I get up to give a talk, I have to say, thou shalt take the soil sample. And, and it is something that we fervently believe in and that we fervently understand that if you're doing this on a regular basis and using that information to your advantage, you can, you can solve a lot of these problems, particularly with regard to soil pH. Anybody want to guess what the most common cause of poor establishment is? Dandelion. 
Perfect. That's exactly right. Low soil pH. What's the most common cause of poor persistence other than overgrazing? Other than overgrazing. Same thing. Somebody's looking ahead. That's not fair. <laughs> Same thing with the poor drought tolerance. Soil pH, poor fertility. All of those things affect some of our real problem areas. Um, let me just uh, speak through this and get on with some beans. Now, obviously, uh, <laughs> got a lot of money tied up in that. Hey, uh, you know, we we have a we have a problem. Uh, that hay is expensive, and it is going to get even more expensive. Uh, fertilizer prices are just going through the roof, and it is going to get worse. If we were to look at, this is projections for 2010, last year's production. This is the breakdown of expense for a hay field on a per ton basis. This is the, the actual cost of producing a ton of Bermuda grass, assuming a yield of six tons per acre. If the yield was five tons per acre, we're talking about about $130 per ton. So, it is a, it's an important aspect that we need to realize, and trust me, if you're buying in hay at $30, $35 a round row, you're stealing. I mean, it flat out is cheap, and, and, and it is a, it's a great deal if you can get it for that price. But it is actually absolutely a uh, much more valuable than, uh, than what they're selling. The thing that I want you to, another aspect of this uh, continuous versus rotational grazing that I want to remind you of is that because you're staggering out that forage and, and rationing it out, you can ration it out longer and not have to feed as much hay. And actually, this is some work that was done with beef cattle, but it's the same exact thing for horses. If we're rotational grazing, we'll feed less hay. The average for that three years was actually 30% less hay. Now, you know, I think there's not a person in this room who would really love to feed about 30% less hay in a year. But it's very possible to do that. One way to do that is through some winter annuals, and I talked about ryegrass earlier. Uh, this is just, uh, this tab is be protected, but this could be done for any of the other data sets that we have for yield trials. I took the, uh, the best, uh, best forage variety out of the ryegrass variety trials, and I for each of the years for the last 11 years from 2007 to 2000, or excuse me, 1997 to 2007. Uh, this blue line represents the average, this red line, the red, the bars represent below average years, and the, uh, the uh, black represent above average. And what I did with that is just to illustrate the point between differences in continuous, rotational, and uh, strip grazing, the really intense side, is to look at the cost of getting that into the mouth of the animal. Now, this is something you want to take home and uh, uh, leave it in the bathroom so you can uh, read it when you've got spare time. Uh, I'll wait for you to get that in a minute. I'm not much of a joke, guy. I'm sorry. But, uh, if we were to buy in a round roll, and it's truly a thousand pound roll of hay, we were to buy that in for $50, and we assume a relatively good conservative estimate of 70%, it's probably more like 50%. If we assume 70 percent, the cost of that ton of hay actually getting it into the mouth of the animal is about $165 per ton. Everywhere along the line, even in our worst case scenario, in the worst kind of grazing situation, it's going to be cheaper for us to graze than it will be to feed hay. If we're doing a good job of rotational grazing, even in the worst of times, it's going to be better than feeding. Okay. Losses accumulate in each step. I've already talked a little bit about this, but you can begin to put some numbers here to it. And it's not at all uncommon for us to have total losses of greater than 70% from the time it was cut until the time it actually makes it into the mouth of the animal. Square versus round. Um, small squares are relatively easy to handle. You don't want to have to do it a whole lot. You don't want to have to handle a lot of hay this way, but uh, if you're feeding just a little bit, this is going to be the best way. Um, but unfortunately, it is very expensive, but it can be actually fed with a little less waste usually if you're hand feeding it out. Uh, very labor intensive. 
Uh, large round bales are also an option for some folks, but they're, they're easy to handle if you've got a tractor, but if you don't have a tractor, they're not impossible to move around. Uh, so uh, they are less expensive on a per ton basis. Uh, lots of waste involved with those. Now, if these are stored outside, or if they're fed on the ground, or if they're allowed to be accessible for a long period of time, you can just mark it in your book. You're going to have a huge amount of loss there as to the uh, hay that you bought in that you paid yearly for is uh, just going to waste. I don't have all that slide, but there are a number of folks now that bring it in. The large rectangular bales, uh, bringing those in and, and feeding off a flake or two at a time, that's a pretty good way of doing it. Uh, again, it has the same logistic issues with regard to handling large bales, uh, they're still going to be 800 to 1,000 pounds, so uh, they may be pretty heavy. Okay, how much hay does my horse need? Now, as I said earlier, each animal is consuming about two to two and a half pounds of feed, dry matter feed, per head per day, or for, on a 100 weight basis. Okay? So if that horse weighs 1,100 pounds, or 1,200 pounds, and you multiply that times 2%, that's approximately what that animal is going to eat. In this case, it's 22 head, pounds per head per day. Now, in addition to that, you've got to account for storage and feeding losses. Okay? So you've got to increase that uh, to account for that. And you also have to account for low forage quality. If you have low forage quality, at least up to a point, and I don't want, I don't want to uh, lead you to believe that they're going to eat a whole lot of straw and uh, make up for it, they're not going to do that. But at least to a point, they're going to eat more of that forage to keep up with their energy needs. And uh, if you do have low quality forage, uh, they're going to eat more of it to a point. Okay. So just as a cost comparison, I've run through some numbers here looking at different loss structures and uh, the value of that. Uh, you can take these numbers and change them. This has been a while since I actually went through and, and uh, calculated this up, but you can change that for whatever your price is at the moment. Then you compare it to, to large bales uh, and get an idea. So this is one 1,100-pound horse for 90 days. That's how much hay in terms of bales that, that would be needed. Okay. And ultimately, this is the this is the bottom line. That's how many you would have to buy to be able to do that for 90 days. Okay. Now let's get into uh, forage quality a little bit. The color's pretty good on that uh, on this uh, slide, and hopefully you can see that. Which is the better lot of hay? The one on the left or the one on the right? Green one. Green one. One on the right. Now let's, let's look at it the way the horse looks at it. All right, I'm being a little facetious. I mean, horses are colorblind. We kind of think that they really appreciate color. It's not necessarily the color that they're looking at. It's the smell. It's the texture. It's the quality. And fundamentally, it gets back to fiber content. That's the primary driver of forage intake. Okay, fiber content. So a little bit of a joke here, but uh, uh, it is a good illustrating point that you know it is more complex than just looking at color. All right. There is no way to know what you're dealing with without a forage test. Period. It's going to cost you 15 bucks to get a forage sample run, uh, and it's going to pay off in the long run. And uh, we'll talk about how that does uh, with uh, with our sweet peas in just a little bit. Uh, I'm going to just speed through this so that you can see what uh, these uh, hay probes look like. Most of your county agents will have one of these and can step you through the process of doing this. So I'm not going to bore you with the details. You've got it here and you can refer back to that. Let me go through just briefly a forage quality breakdown and, and talk about what I talked about earlier, which is what is NDF. Okay. If we think about forage, is, you know, all it is is a, an accumulation of plant cells. And those plant cells have the inside of the cell wall, and then they have the cell wall, which is where all the fiber is at. Inside that cell wall is where we have proteins, oils, minerals, all kinds of easily digested stuff. And then inside that cell wall, we have pectins, hemicellulose, cellulose, lignin, and uh, some silica, some uh, actually silicone primary component there. Now, from this pectins and everything in the green here are very easily digestible. Even you and I could digest that material uh, out of that forage. However, I wouldn't recommend going out and getting a bale of alfalfa on the way home. 
uh, you will not uh, necessarily like it. You'll have a good bloated feeling because you can't do much with this uh, this fiber. Okay, that's where the, the microbes that live in the, the horses' cecum, in the case of ruminant animals in the ruminant, that's what they're actually breaking down and deriving a lot of their energy from. Okay, now. So NDF, and I don't want to go into details on the others. I, I've got some information on our website if you really are wanting to know the definition of all these different terms. But this is the most important one for you is to understand is this neutral detergent fiber because it influences total digestible, digestible nutrients, relative forage quality, which we'll talk about in a minute, and fundamentally the amount of energy that can actually be used by that, by that animal. Now, relative forage quality is probably one of the best tools that we have now to actually compare one lot of hay to another. Relative forage quality predicts energy based on fiber quality and intake. Okay? Quantity of fiber that's there, and also how digestible that fiber is. Now, it combines this into one single value that we can use for alfalfa, that we can use for Bermuda grass, that we can use for orchard grass, Timothy, that we can use if we're a horse producer, we can use it if we're a dairy producer, we can use it if we're a beef cattle producer, we can do, use it if we're producing llamas, okay? Across the spectrum, it's a robust tool that allows us to use it in a lot of different ways. Everything in the forage world basically is based off of alfalfa, relative to alfalfa. And if you see a score of 100 for our few, that's equivalent to full bloom alfalfa. So that's about as bad as alfalfa gets, it's about 100. It can't get worse than that, but typically it's going to be no worse than that. One thing that this could do is actually simplify the marketing. And uh, in our upcoming hay convention that I'll talk about, we're going to be visiting on how we can actually uh, do that. But what's nice about RQ, again, this is a robust thing that we can use in a variety of different species across different physiological states. For horses, here is the range in which I would recommend you looking for hay samples to come into. So if we're dealing with an idle horse, one that's you know getting some light work, but not, not a whole lot of work, your range here is relatively low, doesn't need a whole lot of, of energy, and this is actually going to meet the energy needs for the most part of that horse. You may still want to feed a little sweet feed, but you know, if you get up on the upper end of this, you may not even need to do that. Um, broodmare or one that's doing a medium amount of work, this is the range that we, which we want to see. If we have a nursing mare or one of those animals that's doing a lot of work, or a weanling or something like that, we're trying to uh, get a lot of weight on, uh, that may be a different story. It's going to need to be a little higher. Okay, common questions on interpreting the forage quality report. Okay, when you get that forage quality report back, up in the right hand corner, it's going to have RQ, relative forage quality. That's the first thing that I look at. This column here, this as sampled column, just draw a very big old X through that. That is not important. It's, it is important, but it's not something you need to use to compare one lot of hay against another. Now, immediately you will see here in this particular instance, dry matter basis for fruit protein, 4.5%. That is terrible. Absolute terrible. Okay. Nearly 74% neutral detergent fiber. Going back to that talk about compaction and, and high fiber there, uh, terrible situation there. Very high lignin, uh, TEN, that TEN number is, is uh, probably uh, much higher than, than what it probably needs to be. Um, somewhere along the line, I guess the difference between uh, NDF and ADF here is what caused that TEN to be a little bit higher. Notice here that the energy values are relatively low. If you were to plug those into that uh, database, that website that I was talking about earlier, you would see that you would be hard pressed to develop a ration that would actually uh, work for, uh, for horses here. Okay, how good is this hay? Crude protein is 13.5%. Good hay, bad hay, what do you think? Good, very good. Well, probably, uh, you know, it would be one to look at and you'd think it would be, but it actually came from that hay bale right there. More specifically, it came from this 
outer 14 inches or so of weathered layer that that hay bale had been sitting outside. This actually had been sitting outside for two years. Um, so what happens is whenever you weather that, whenever rain falls on it, it leaches all the good stuff out. It leaves the nitrogen primarily there. So you end up with high crude protein. So that was a trick question, but what I'm trying to illustrate is crude protein is not the most important number to be looking at in that forage quality report. Start with that RFQ number. That's your first approximation. Begin to categorize that hay as to where it needs to fit. Uh, just some more data on, or information here on uh, crude protein. Tells you nothing about the form of nitrogen, not much at all about energy. It's important, it's just something we've overemphasized over the years. Get back to that question that was asked earlier about laminitis. Any grass hay can cause founder or laminitis in my horses, or for that matter, any grass pasture can cause laminitis in the founder of my horse. Plausible, confirmed, or myth busted? Any ideas? Well, there are some grass hays that may, and I want to emphasize may, cause laminitis. May not. Um, there are some, some circumstantial evidence, let's say, that, that implicates uh, certain types of days. Uh, it's, in my opinion, in every instance I've been involved in where I've looked at it, it usually comes back to the fact that it's, it wasn't the hay, it was some of the feed that they were feeding at the same time that caused the problem. Okay? I'm not saying it can't happen, I'm just saying it's not typically the cause in and of itself. Okay, so let's talk about this myth, or is it, is it true? Carbohydrate storage in forage species differs from one species to another. The one type of carbohydrate that's been linked most to the uh, laminitis problem has been the fructans. Uh, fructans are uh, typically only produced in certain types of uh, forages and under only certain types of conditions. Those conditions are typically when uh, it's cold, it's been warm for a few days, and then it turns off extremely cold. Not the kind of extreme cold that we get. The type of extreme cold they get in Colorado, and, uh, Nebraska, and Kansas, and those areas. Okay? Uh, it's, it's very, very rare that we have grass that actually it itself is going to be implicated in laminitis uh, because of the grass types that we have. Let me start with legumes here. I think I've got this under cover so that it would work. Uh, legumes, they store their carbohydrate as starch. It's going to be in the cap root, stones, and rhizomes, not in the part that's actually edible. Cool season grasses, the annuals and perennials, can produce fructans. Uh, typically, we're not going to have much problem with that because we don't have a whole lot of cool season grasses that produce that. Call fescue does not produce fructans. It's not all false and cool season grasses. And even uh, the annual ryegrass produces very, very little of it and only under very extreme conditions where it is. Uh, all of our warm season annual grasses, the primary carbohydrate storage source is actually sucrose. Uh, warm season perennial grass is primarily starch. Again, these are not problematic necessarily, it's the fructans. Orchard grass, um, case may be made for a perennial ryegrass, although I'm not certain about that, but primarily where there's been an implication has been orchard grass. Um, uh, Timothy is also one that, that can produce some proteins. But again, um, those instances are, are relatively rare, and especially for us, it's, it's uh, not as big a deal. Now notice that our perennial, some warm season perennial grasses, there's not a problem. And in fact, most of the prescription that we would give to someone that's dealing with laminitis is to feed Bermuda grass because it actually will help uh, uh, remedy that problem. Good quality grass will make up for that. Okay, hay storage. I've uh, kind of beat this dead horse, but I want to just illustrate here. Uh, twine wrapped bales stored outside on the ground. The average depth of loss is 14 or 4.4 inches. And the actual dry matter loss, this is not counting the part that's weathered that they're going to, uh, that they're actually going to avoid eating, but just the stuff that leaches out of that represents about 18.2% of the, of the total dry matter that's there. So storing those bales outside is very costly. If we look at the spoilage depth, 
at four inches is a, is a rough average for us. Now there'll be years where it'll be six or eight or more. Um, but if we look at four inches as being a rough average, we have a five foot tall round bale out there, four inches, that means we're going to have about 25% loss. Of just the weather loss. It doesn't count the additional loss, excuse me, that we get in the hay. So at some point, we've got to recognize that we're paying for a barn whether we want to or not. You know, it, it's expensive to store that hay outside without any kind of cover. So if we're dealing with hay value that's, let's say it's $100 per ton, it's probably off the scale now in terms of uh, true value. We're getting good quality stuff. Now let's just be conservative here at 20% loss. Then what we can do is actually pay, we can afford to pay on a barn about $14 per square foot. We can build a pretty nice little shed, a hay shed, for $14 per square foot. Right. Um, let me move on and talk about feed loss. This is true. This work was actually done for beef cattle, but the same is true for horses. And actually, an argument can be made that it's actually worse <laughs> for horses. Okay? But um, I don't have the data in this particular slide for these cone rings, but trust me, I think those are the, the, the real way to feed, hay, especially to horses. Uh, this one's not designed for horses necessarily, but there are some that are. And if you can find those, the losses, the feeding losses on those typically are less than 5%. That's not, that's not saying that if you've got a lot of weathered material there, they're not going to eat that part, but just the losses associated with the ring about five percent. Let's get back to that. You sure. know those percentages there? Yep. Just real quick. What about just putting it out on the ground? I know yep. the old days where they just roll in. Bed down. Minute. So you're getting a tremendous amount of loss. Yep. Sixteen percent or it's, <laughs> the, the data would suggest somewhere in the neighborhood of thirty to fifty percent loss in that kind of scenario. Depends on how long it's out there and you know what the weather conditions are. But uh, it's a lot. It's way more. You can buy a lot of hay rooms to compensate for that loss. That's a good point. I'm not going to go into great detail here. This is just one option. I think it's a really good one, relatively inexpensive. And on a cost per bale basis, you can kind of go through that calculation on the end sheet and kind of get an idea of what we're talking about here. That's not the only option. There are other kinds of options that are a little low cost, the more labor involved in it, a little bit more headache sometimes. Uh, but uh, you can look at a variety of different options there. Let me, uh, let me just kind of wrap things up here just to give a quick plug for our Southeast Hay Convention that's coming up. If you are uh, a commercial hay producer, you're producing a lot of hay, or even if you're just producing it for yourself and you want to learn more about how to produce good quality hay, and even if you're a hay broker, if you want to uh, get into that side of it, there's going to be information about uh, that aspect of hay production there as well. Uh, the Southeast Hay Convention in Macon, the end of March. We'll be at the uh, Georgia Farm Bureau's uh, main office there. Uh, another thing that I would encourage you to look for, and we do this every year in uh, September, is the grazing schools that we hold every year. And uh, every year we usually have about five out of the 35 there that are horse hunters, and we'd love to have uh, more folks uh, take part in that. And we actually go through in much greater detail what you know, some of the grazing aspects that we talked about earlier, and actually go through and plan some, some paddocks and uh, some pasture systems there. A couple other books that would be of interest to you is uh, Grass Productivity, uh, one that I use a lot, and then uh, Horse Behavior, which is one that has a lot of good information about grazing habit and also many other cribbing behavior and that sort of thing, um, uh, written by George Larry. Um, a couple other sources that we have on the website, uh, those are listed for you there. Um, give you some information. Again, our website address is georgiaforges.com. And you can find our podcast there. And with that, let me entertain any questions. Yes, sir. Do you have any information? We have probably about 100 acres of high-quality river bottom. That we don't graze on anymore. We have cattle every year for years. Any information where we can get somebody that comes in because there is such high quality forage goes away there mm -hmm. every year. 
Um, and I, I thought about cutting hay on that. Mm -hmm. I just don't have the equipment to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't need that much information where I can find somebody that would come in and cut that hay and take 7% of it and leave me 30%. Right. right. There, there has to be some something like that. Yeah. There are some websites out there that help to make those kinds of connections. Um, it's one of those things that it, it actually kind of crosses a bit of a line for us in extension to, to do that. Now, some on a local level, some extension agents might help you out there and, and make those connections or at least get the word out. Um, but, um, you know, inevitably we start doing too much of that and, you know, one party, it's a he, yeah, she, yeah, he says, yeah. she says kind of thing and we have to try to stay out of that sort of stuff. But, but there are some websites that do that. So. Uh, will this be four sites? Yeah, that's just a shame. And, and another good so much of it to go away. Yeah, another good site also is uh, the George Marsh Bulletin. That's a, goes to a large area. But getting out, getting your you know name out there in some of those hot spots and the coffee shops and whatnot. Um, but uh, there's no real central clearinghouse for that kind of, that kind of thing. Yes, sir. Uh, stop this out. Of oat hay, very good. It's uh, good quality stuff. Um, we don't grow a lot of oats in this area of the, of the state, but certainly if we get further south, we grow quite a bit. Uh, it's like everything else, though. If you cut it at a bad time, it's like straw. But if you harvest it appropriately and you are able to cure it out in a rapid time frame, it works pretty good. Yes, sir. So when we should stop grazing, I think within a slide or two of that is actually a, um, a list of in grazing heights and inches. And that's what you need to refer to. Uh, it's kind of hard on that particular graph to say because it, it, the x-axis there is day. I mean, it really doesn't make sense. It needs to be whatever the residual height is. But that's critically important, getting back to that concept of leaving enough residual there so grass will grow grass. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. You talk about seed in the pasture. I have, I have the carpet syndrome. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and I have a seed in the pasture. The grasses that you plant in the fall, you've got several. Can you just mix those seeds up and broadcast them together? You can broadcast those seeds. Um, Typically, the, with especially things like rye, okay, cereal rye, not rye grass, but rye, uh, that needs to be planted a little bit deeper. But rye grass, um, tall fescue, most of those, and, and all the clovers can be broadcast, and you'd be covered a little bit. Okay, you're just, you're just scratching them in, or, or you, know, you don't really want to bury them deep, you're just, just uh, using a heavy drag or something like that to. Drag them in to get good seed soil contact. They can be broadcasted, but your stands usually end up being a lot more erratic, not a real good uniform stand. Uh, there are a number of uh, just about every county, there's someone there or a number of someone's there that will actually go out and drill with a no till drill uh, into your pastures, ryegrass, tall fescue, even Bermuda grass seed. That kind of information we can get you hooked up with that through the county extension office or through the conservation office, inner CS office. Um, they'll come out and drill in the ground. Yeah, well, the extension office and our CS office won't necessarily, but they can get you in contact with someone who will does. and That's does right. contract. Relatively expensive, but it's 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 relatively cheap rather than yeah, it, it's relative cheap to. Uh, to feeding hay and that sort of thing. Going back to that graph where I was showing that annual ryegrass and the cost per ton of intake, that included all of those costs in it. It's actually some rather conservative estimates of establishment costs. All of that. What about planting in the spring of the year? Planting in the spring of the year. Um, yeah. Have we missed the photograph? Is it too bad? 
Uh, if you were to put out white clover now, you, you would probably be okay. But I would not wait much more than a couple, three weeks before I do that. Uh, spring planted uh, forages in general, with the exception of Bermuda grass, which needs to be planted in, in April, May, early June. Um, don't even think about it. It is, is it a waste? just too difficult. It is a waste because um, the grass weeds and the other kinds of weeds that are going to come up at that same time are far more vigorous than, uh, than tall fescue that's going to be kind of spindly anyway because it really isn't going to be happy with that hot temperatures that it's going to be in camera. So uh, it's going to be a waste. You really need to do that in the fall of the year. Yes, ma'am. That's right. Yes. So that so is that is true. It would cause. That is true. It can it can make that situation worse, especially. I mean, it's it's sugar. Mm -hmm. Fundamentally, the it breaks down into sugar. If they're insulin resistant, uh, you know, they're going to have a problem with, no matter what kind of sugar it is. So it is true that needs to be longer material, more mature, less highly digestible, uh, less soluble sugars. Now, I said all that, but I forgot to mention that we actually do test for water-soluble carbohydrates. So if you, are, if you suspect a problem, we can give you some feedback as to where it is relative to where uh, other samples from that same species would normally be. And you can see if it's relatively high. What type of grasses would be the best print for horses that are to Bermuda grass, it's going to be very low in water soluble carbohydrates. Annual ryegrass is probably going to be among the highest in water soluble carbohydrates. Um, so, Bermuda grass would probably be your best bet there. Tall fescue is going to be kind of intermediate, but certain times of the year it's going to be higher than insoluble sugars as well. But again, you know, if, if we're really doing so, laminitis versus insulin resistance, a little bit of a different, different scenario. Um, and in that scenario where we're dealing with insulin resistance, where they're having difficulty uh, with high sugar content, it doesn't matter the source of sugar. Uh, it could be fructans or sucrose or, or whatever. It could be in that case, for me, grass would be your best bet to try to keep that from a problem. You didn't discuss spraying herbicides. I didn't. Um, that is. Uh, Important aspect. <laughs> well, the reason I didn't put it in, in there is because uh, there are all kinds of problems, and each situation needs to be addressed on a case by case basis. Okay, because if you have if your major problem is horse metal, then that's a different suite of chemicals than if your major problem is. Um, Blackberry, or if your major problem is um, horse uh, uh, foxtail. Right. We got a lot of foxtail. Just a yep. general pasture weeds, not yep. heavy variety. Yep. But I don't want to kill the, the clover and stuff. Well, unfortunately, any herbicides that you put out there, if you're going to kill broadleaves, you're going to kill the clover as well. Okay. Now, the nice thing about white clover and most of the white clovers is they produce a lot of seed. That seed will regenerate. Eventually, it will come back. But um, what kind do you spray? That that gets back to weed specific context again. Okay, so if it's horse nettle, you've got uh, it, it'll be in the springtime of the year. If we're talking about thistles, it would be in November. So again, that's where you really need to sit down, and that's the reason why I really wanted to emphasize that is that you really need to sit down with your county agent there and say these are the problems that I've got. And if somebody at least sit down with you and discuss it yeah. and, and identify the weeds and if they don't know what it is they'll send it to me or they'll send it to one of the weed specialists and we'll get it figured out so we can come up with a solution for you <laughs>
<laughs> Take digital pictures. <laughs> yes, sir. Buttercup. Everybody. Everybody's got buttercup, especially horse pack. Three years ago, all of us were just right here and kicked. Yep. Long time. So, buttercup and uh, bitter sneezeweed are, are major problems. They're two different times of the year. They look kind of similar because they're both yellow. But they are major problems in, in horse pastures. Um, buttercup needs to be sprayed pretty much right about now. Okay. Um, and, and, and actually, if you go out right now, there's a lot of herbicides that are good and relatively cheap. But if you wait until you see those yellow flowers out there, you've waited too long. Yep, that'll do a good job. Weed Master usually does a pretty good job on that. Weedmaster has 2,4-D and uh, Banvoy or Dicamba to give a large spectrum. Grazon will help us. In my them. own observations, 2,4-D um, esters across most of the but mm -hmm. any time that I use crossbow, I get a better lack Yeah. On more of that. Yeah, crossbow is, is uh, triclopyr, and uh, that's right, isn't it? Is it triclopyr? Uh, it is a much more aggressive herbicide. Much better for at least some of those weeds. Because actually, two four D is not bad for single drift. Of active ingredient or something? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's it's not the ingredient. It's not the percent of the ingredient. It's actual ingredient. It's, it's what's you know some of these you can put on in very very minute <coughs> amounts of actual active ingredient and get a lot of control. Yeah, that works a lot. In my opinion, it's best to do that as a, as a general rule, uh, at least a week in some cases. Now, that being said, there are certain scenarios where it's not necessary. The, the, um, the reason I, I say that blanket uh, statement is, is because... We're going to drag you into this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's reason number one. <laughs> reason number two is, is that some of those herbicides uh, and some of those weeds, when you kill them, will actually produce, and they will produce prussic acid. Prussic acid has signs, it's signs. If they eat it, not necessarily going to eat it. So, out of abundance of caution, I say it's important. In terms of the safety of the herbicide for the horses, everything that we apply, and I mean everything, it would not have a label if it was not safe to do that. But there are some situations where there is a grazing restriction. In other words, on the label it says don't graze for 30 days or don't pay for 30 days or something like that. And you can buy by that. As a general rule, you, know, you can spray them out and water out there. As long as you don't give them a spoon, you're okay. Uh, but, but as an unbuttoned precaution, my scan response is at least a week once a day. Just in case. Just in case. I have a question. Um, Johnson grass. Yes. Uh, I've got a field that's got a patch of Johnson grass in it. And I've heard some people say it's poisonous and horses. I've heard people so Johnson grass is an example of like I was talking about earlier. If you spray it with a herbicide and it begins to wilt, it produces prussic acid. Okay. So it can be a problem that, that way. However, that prussic acid is only uh, short-lived. It only lasts about a week and it'll dissipate and it'll be gone. So if you cut it for hay, it's not a big problem. But uh, I assume this is in a hay field, right? Well, no, this is, I've, I've got my, my property pastured into two um, paddocks, uh -huh. and one side has like a, a large clump of Johnson grass, and I've just been concerned in the other one. But the horses over there, so I know. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, normally we don't see a lot of Johnson grass in pastures, and the reason being is, is they get it when it's about this tall, they really love to eat it, and they'll graze it out. It's not very tolerant of, uh, of grazing. Well, I haven't had horses on it um, until just Okay, I, so that I explains why. I just want to send my property out. Yeah. And you may not even see it this year, actually. If, if those horses are out there and grazing uh, the majority of the time, you may not even see it because you know, they'll, they'll get it before it ever gets big. But if it does get big, um, there are some uh, controls that we can put out there to selectively take it out. Um, and there's, there's actually two or three good ones on the market now that relatively inexpensively can take it out. Uh, 
and we can we can step you through that if you if you need help. Uh, one of them would be Pastora. That's probably the best one in the hay field. Pastora. Another one's called uh, Outrider. Outrider. Very similar kind of compounds, uh, and, and that's um, they they work pretty good in a in a hay field. Control Johnson grass. Uh, let me get her in the back, and then I'll come back to you. Most of, uh, well, the, the ones that are really aggressive, uh, you do need to have a, a pesticide license for. Yes, I believe that's right. Grazon's a restricted use. Uh, there are some new ones that are similar to Grazon, arguably even better than Grazon, that you don't have to have a uh, license for. Uh, maybe, but maybe not either. The one Grazon Grazon PSD is is the old standby. There's now one called Grazon Next that is kind of the next evolution of that. It's also you may also see it named for, Forefront. Okay, that one you can buy without a uh, pesticide license and apply. It's, it's, it's perfectly fine. Yes, sir. This one I mentioned Fox. Yeah. I'm short and I passed. I'm so sorry. <laughs> No. No. Unfortunately not. If it's in Bermuda grass, we've got a fighting chance. But if it's in fescue, we don't have anything that we can do. Foxtail in tall fescue. That is one that we just don't have much in the arsenal. Uh, now they'll eat it when it's this tall before you actually realize it's foxtail, but you know, that they'll eat other things before then and allow it to get up. It'll turn into a, one of the rough areas that it's talking about. Yes, ma'am. Tropical soda apple. Um, uh, probably the best one on that, Ricky, is probably grazed on next to me. Uh, that, that new uh, amino pyrrolid is the new. Active ingredient in Grazon next. And it does a pretty good job on, on most of those things. I might have to. I'm sorry? Uh, that would be June. Uh, you might want to, in that particular instance, go ahead and verify that before we get to the thing here just to make sure. Number one, that that's the best one for you. There's so many of them, I can keep them all in my head. There's some weed scientists that can, but. The county agent has a list, they have the master list, and they can go through it as, as easy as I can. And some of these guys have been doing it a lot longer than I have, too. And they, know that. And they also know perhaps what that dealer has uh, there locally. And most of these weed killers are sprays? Yes. Uh, usually it's a spray? Yes, usually there are sprays. There, on a rare occasion, there will be some that are granular form, but that, that's very, very rare. And will our county agent be able to kind of point us towards somebody that can help us spray if we don't have the equipment? Yes. Usually there will be an ag business somewhere there close that, that can service, depending on where you live at. I mean, where, where, are, you, where are you living in at? Haversham. Yeah, I'm sure there's somebody here close. Uh, Steve's not here tonight. But, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes. <laughs> yep. I mean, I'll do it if I have to, but I <laughs> Why? Why would you want to do that? Because my neighbors used to, uh, no. before I kept my horses that live behind me, they used chicken litter twice a year religiously. And we had all kinds of bizarre bugs coming to our house. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was awful. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, inevitably, uh, you know, you go out and you, and, uh, you put that chicken litter out and it's uh, Aunt Myrtle's uh, birthday party that yeah. same weekend. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, yes, there are good alternatives to, to chicken litter. More expensive. You know, commercial fertilizer is going to be more expensive. But we've, we've only got maybe a total of six acres. Yeah. 
Yeah, in those instances, uh, yep. yeah, they can either spread it for you, or you can even get a buggy a lot of times to that will be a fertilizer buggy that's a spreader that you can do it yourself. But they'll, they'll oftentimes they'll come up and do it to whatever company you want to do with it. Yep. Yep. Oh, man. Uh, I hate to use an economist term, but it depends. <laughs> okay. okay. Because the most expensive part of fertilizer is the time of potash. It's getting to be that way. It used to be that potash was the cheapest thing, but uh, sure. yeah. nitrogen and potash now. This year, I'm using a different fertilizer than I usually use, and uh, I reduced the potash and saved over $100 a ton. Mm -hmm. So, first thing I would say, and I have to say this, and I don't have to, but it's really important, soil sample. <laughs> because if you... Okay. I would... I'd probably been on a hundred different uh, farm visits since I've been in Georgia. And inevitably, if we're having a troubleshooting problem, about 80% of the time it's it's a soils related problem mm -hmm. that, or at least part of it is a soils related problem. And usually potassium is deficient. Uh, and you can, you can lay off the potassium for a little bit, but eventually it will catch up. And it's a whole lot harder to get it back than to keep it there. Okay. So that being said, potassium is expensive. And it may be a situation, if you've been using a lot of triple 17 or whatever it might have been, uh, or poultry litter or whatever, you may not need potassium. And you may need, may be able to cut it out. You may be able to cut out phosphorus. So uh, start with a soil sample first and see where you're at. If you need it, though, you really do need it. The reason, the reason I say that is, uh, particularly for Bermuda grass. Bermuda grass, if you run a long time without potassium putting in the soil, your Bermuda grass will begin to, to die. It will, it will just become less vigorous and the stand will just disappear. Same thing, because actually the requirement for tall fescue for potassium is actually even higher than Bermuda grass. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 